Smith or something got in your nose, guy? <laughs> Hollywood joke. No, I'm gonna stop knocking on the end of my tongue. More drugs for the kid. The OTO is composed of a group of magicians, male and female, who accept the principles of the Book of the Law and Lieber Oz. We study and teach yoga, meditation, ceremonial magic, Kabbalah, divination, and related facets of the Western mystery tradition. Our central headquarters is located in Berkeley, California, with numerous semi-autonomous groups throughout the country and Canada. The ritual depicted here was performed October 31st, 1980 by the then Tehuti chapter of New York City. This footage is a dress rehearsal the night before the ritual. The OTO itself, no, is not a religion. The religion to us is the Book of the Law. Um, the Book of the Law is a revealed writing, um, very much like the Bible, very much like the Quran, in which Aleister Crowley is described as the prophet um, of this of these higher forces which have come to deliver a message to humanity. All of us here subscribe to that religion. One of the commentaries that Aleister Crowley wrote on the Book of the Law is called Liber Oz. It is a very short and succinct document, one page long, um, composed of words of one syllable, in which he commented on the Book of the Law in terms of a political philosophy. Um, the OTO is composed of people who accept the Book of the Law, that therefore is our religion, and we are trying to propagate the doctrines of Libra Oz in society. However, we are not a political organization in no way, shape, or form. Are we a political organization? In fact, our articles of incorporation legally within the state of California and New York forbid us from engaging in direct political activity. But I would have to say that we are political in the sense that the, the mission of the OTO as I see it is to bring about certain changes which are set forth in the book of the law. And one manifestation of, of these changes is political. But the, the political changes are almost a byproduct. They've, they've got to come after and as a response to certain more fundamental changes. Uh, changes in values, changes in uh, basically the way people think. And that will cause a political change. But we're, we're working at it from that angle rather than trying to change the way people think and people's values by politics. That seems to me particularly, <clears throat> politics to me, at, in agreement with what Bill was saying, seems to be putting the cart before the horse. Um, humanity is not ready to really engage in politics because not, humanity um, is not ready to engage in self-control. You know, we teach uh, in the OTO the development of the will, and that involves self-control, willpower, and the ability to, um, you know, submit, in a sense, to um, divine revelation. We do have that religion in the sense that we, we definitely subscribe to divine revelation because our entire um, philosophy is we do believe in revealed religion because we accept the book of the law. We accept the book of the law as a message from God to humanity through the office of a prophet named Aleister Crowley who is specifically mentioned in the book of the law as the prophet of the gods delivering a message to humanity which will aid humanity, us all, in our process of self-liberation. Therefore, we, you know, by definition, are a religious group of people banding together under the banner of the OTO. Perhaps my dear friend to the left will comment on why he has banded, he as a religious member of, has banded himself to the OTO. I'm not a religious member. You wish. I 
do things religiously in the Skeet's Etymological Dictionary definition of the word religiously. However, the concept of religion and the connotations that it has in our present society are important to me. I think that people who believe things without facts are idiots. The entire concept in my mind of the OTO is not that it is a religious concept, but that it is a provable scientific fact. You do certain practices, certain things occur. And this <clears throat> puts it in a different category than what we call religion. We seem to think that people who attain high states of trance in other mystery cults are not religious because they are not in the Judeo-Christian mainstream. They are somehow aberrant. But holy men, nonetheless, we always call them holy men. It's tons of fun. I disagree with the use of the term God, specifically, because man is God. And we create our gods who create us for our convenience to explain things that we cannot explain in other ways as a working hypothesis until we can explain them in other ways. This is science. Magic has always been unexplained science. Any sufficiently advanced technology has always been considered magic to those who did not understand it. Light a match in front of an aborigine and watch the reaction. Or do it a hundred years ago anyway. And, or a zip all lighter for that matter. To take it up a step. Now I don't think we're a religious body. I think we are a training cell for people who choose to investigate themselves and the unknown portions of the universe, the unknown energies of the universe that science is slowly whittling away at and getting closer to, but is not to the point of fully acknowledging yet. They will, eventually. When we say time is cyclical, they come up with the concept of tachyons. We come closer and closer to a common point of reference. As to the political nature of it, which I was invited to comment on, from my point of view, my involvement in the OTO is specifically to eventually have legislated, if we keep on using such archaic means of controlling each other, to legislate Liberaz, the statement of the rights of man, as the law of the land. To find out more about what I mean about that, it is recommended that you read the Bronze. I think I've said enough. Yes. I think that as many members of the OTO as you can get into a room, you're going to have that many different answers as to why these people join the OTO and what it means to them. And if there is any common ground, uh, to put it in as few words as possible, it's that everyone believes that do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law which does not mean do what you want to do, but rather that every individual has a purpose and has a function in reality. And it is the duty and it is the right of every individual to find out what that purpose is and to do it. And that's why we're all here. That is essentially the program of the OTO. And as to how that program should best be affected and carried out, um, that's pretty much up to individual interpretation. We don't have an essential dogma at all, other than the two books which we have all mentioned repeatedly being Book of the Law and We Rocks. Those are the only thing, the only two books that you will find OTO, all OTO members in agreement upon by necessity of their membership in the OTO. If they do not accept those two books, um, at some time very early on in their career, they will be, um, by their own choice, forced to leave. We insist upon um, the validity of those two documents. We insist with the entire thrust of our order upon those two documents. Both of them are available in published form to anyone who would care to read them. By 
by a greater human or a beyond a superhuman intelligence um, who called itself I was a I W A S S who delivered through a voice transmission this message to Alistair Crowley in Cairo in Egypt in 1904 um, Crowley took it down on April 8th, 9th, and 10th in three one-hour sessions beginning at noon and ending precisely at one on each of those three days. Um, Libras was written several years later by him, by Alistair Crowley himself, and the exercise involved in the writing of Libras was to explain the law as simply as possible in words of one syllable only. So that is very short, um, very succinct, uh, in some ways very shocking, but when one reads it and considers it with a great deal of thought and meditation, even those points which are shocking become crystal clear. As a young person um, who had been turned on to spiritual writings and spiritual disciplines um, in my later teenage years, um, I was very baffled to find that the majority of philosophical teachings which had come through on a religious level were primarily at that point coming from the East. There were our imported Hindu gurus, there was certainly Alan Watts writing so, so beautifully about Zen and, and Orient techniques, there was the um, enormous influence of an influx of Buddhists and Buddhism, um, there was just a, a, an enormous field of, of spiritual um, forces available to an American which were all oriental in, in um, flavor, in um, derivation. It was not until I delved a whole lot deeper into the subject that I realized that we in the West have had a specific mystical tradition which has existed for as long as we have. Um, and that this tradition rose uh, through um, the church in its own peculiar way, um, through the Judaic influences in their own peculiar way. Um, it really began to get hot during the time of the Crusades when the Knights Templars um, had really explored the wisdom of the Near East and incorporated it within themselves in, in, in a very real way to themselves. Um, in the West, all kinds of mysticism and mystery religions um, or mystical practices had been crushed by burning at the stake and, and numerous other well-documented inquisitional practices. Um, I learned about alchemy. I learned about Rosicrucianism. I learned about Hermeticism. I learned about magic. And I found somehow that all of these things answered a much deeper need in myself for a philosophical or a spiritual view. Of course they were similar to all of the Eastern disciplines to which um, everyone else was, was so attracted, but there was both a, a certain pride in knowing that a spiritual tradition had existed for um, hundreds if not thousands of years in the West, and there was a um, much easier affinity with concepts in the West which somehow never, at least to my present apprehension, involved such an enormous um, disdain for reality and the world as we knew it and know it. Um, one who, who studies the, the Eastern doctrines finds a sickness 
with the world, a despair of the world, a feeling as if the world were a veil of tears from which we must use every effort to escape. Um, in the West, because we, our spiritual philosophy, so to speak, in, in, in the occult is, is a tantric philosophy, which is, of course is an Eastern term, we deal with reality as it exists. We deal with it in a scientific way, we deal with it unafraid, we deal with it, in fact, without the desire to escape. Western occultism is, is based more on the psychology, I would say, of trying to control, to understand, to um, investigate clearly and realistically what it is that we're involved in. When we attain spiritual states, um, we go to our jobs the next day. We um, look at nature as a force that is our friend, as it were. We do not um, seek to mortify the flesh in, in the way of the you know, Eastern traditions, which was incorporated so heavily into Catholicism. Um, we do not seek to escape anything other than lack of self-discipline, anything other than lack of self-will, anything other than ignorance. We seek to escape only that which limits us and thereby revel in the world um, as kings of the earth, which is, which is a quotation of the Book of the Law. We seek to establish our position in the universe in a healthy and happy way. And that was, I think, my major reason the Law answered that very succinctly. All the sorrows are but as shadows. They pass and are done. But there is that which remains. In other words, there is a higher state above that. We don't have to self-denigrate. We don't have to hate materialism. We merely have to put everything in perspective and realize where our perspectives lie. Because the entire system that we deal with is always a reordering of priorities to realize what is important, what is essential to the true will, and what is the fluvia, what is garbage, what is, what is flotsam and jetsam that we don't need to deal with. And the whole system deals with stripping away all of that garbage. And suddenly, when you've done it to the point where there's nothing left, there's something left. Some call it God. Some call it the Holy Guardian Angel. Some call it nirvana. And in general, the only function of the organization is that when two men band together, they can ostensibly do better than the added labors of one plus one. That's the only reason for an organization. The synergistic principle. Yes. We engage heavily in dramatic ritual. This is one of our um, primary activities. We conduct um, a mass, <clears throat> which is composed of the same elements that were used by the Catholic Church in the construction of their own mass, um, that were known perhaps the earliest ceremony of religious um, endeavor was a use of food and drink to commemorate the relationship between man and God. Um, we do rituals like the one that um, we're seeing here on the tape, um, which commemorate seasonal times, seasonal periods, the ebb and flow of nature. Um, in, in a way that makes sense to us as, as spiritual beings. These are things which you can do by yourself and, and, and we all do by ourselves. But when joined together in a group, we can do it better. Um, groups also serve another function of inspiration, uh, mutual inspiration and um, mutual encouragement to, to efforts. Um, I know myself that the OTO sort of keeps me on my toes. Um, it's one thing to 
read a book for myself. It's another thing to be asked by someone um, two days later what I thought of it and what value it might be to them. Um, it's a social principle in that sense. The OTO is definitely a social organization. It has the um, a, a function within the role of the social life of people who are so committed to this kind of philosophy. Um, you said, and you and I have had many discussions on the kinds of things we share, the ecstasy at a sunrise or a sunset. That's the one thing that always kills me about about the um, Eastern folk, or, or you know the Catholics, of course. The Catholic, that type of Christianity is, is so old that it might, at this point, be discarded as ridiculous. The the concept of vicarious atonement and original sin. This is what's indicated by the ritual. Um, you know, we we have here a situation in which um, you know there there is there is you know a woman um, who is seeking and the woman in this case represents the soul you know on a philosophical level um seeking to find her lover and you know find once again the happiness that she's lost and at the same time finding her lover in a land of pain and death she wants the lover but she doesn't want the pain we accept pain. We accept pain as much as we accept the sunrise and the sunset. We accept the whole show. That is the tantric. You know, that is the tantric attitude toward life. Everything that is is equal, is real, nothing is more desirable or even less desirable than anything else. We're here to enjoy the entire menu. We don't skip dessert. Um, we don't skip the spices. We don't skip anything. She tried to skip it and was totally unsatisfied in that effort. And somehow through the course of her wanderings, she was finally able to accept the pepper <laughs> and glorify in its taste. The glory is what we want. We want a lot of glory, see. The glory is the joy. I'd like to try and explain this in a little more metaphysical terms for those spiritualists who may tune in on this side of this teaching. But it, it's valid. It's valid. Most people think of Mahatmas, holy men, as people with white, glistening, glowing arms. Now, what we are trying to do is to absorb everything to draw into ourselves every single conceivable point event so that eventually we can understand and know the entire universe. Now this has an interesting metaphysical reaction. Your aura gets darker until it finally winks out just as a black hole by its own gravity, by the fact that it does absorb everything, even absorbs the light it needs. This, I think, really gets to the heart of what we're trying to do, to absorb the entire universe into ourselves. But so that we may become the entire universe. And because when you no absorb it, you are it. No distinction. And the idea that we have, we, well, not that we have, <laughs> that we aspire to black auras really describes, I think, in metaphysical terms, what we're trying to do. That's very poetic, you know. What, yeah, well, yeah, sure. The it's Book of the Law of Lyric, it's, it's yeah. nice. It's, but it's really what it is. It's really what we're trying to do, to take it all in, accept everything. Pain and pleasure are two sides of the same coin. So eat the penny you've got. The Book of the Law says, let there be no difference between, between any one thing and any other thing for thereby there cometh hurt. This may seem like a little ridiculous in terms of trying to cross the street. Um, it obviously makes a difference whether the light is red or green. Just quoting the book of the law here in a How did I do that? Let there be no difference made. Let there be no difference made among you. Between you and the other. Could you stop the tape?
I think it's another point that, that just occurred to me as, as I was listening to Gurney talk and Bill walk back into the room. These are two people um, who I would never have met had it not been for our common interest in this philosophy. Uh, Bill is from Georgia, Gurney's from Philadelphia, I was born in New Jersey, uh, Gurney was born in God knows Rochester and all kinds of places Ooh. all over um, the United States and the world. Um, we are drawn together through our common interest in this philosophy. That has a great deal to do with the Book of the Law. Um, someone who is interested in art will, will generally, um, unless perhaps you know he or she is a genius of such magnitude that they do not need human company, will generally go to an art school, join a guild, um, go to many museums where they will occasionally meet other people. Um, this is a meeting place for Thelma. There is one other consideration, though, to keep it in perspective, and that is that this social interaction may also account for the muddy color of our auras. We do have a tendency to rub our excreta off on others by our interactions and that's why we have to be very meticulous in our actions and interactions to keep our individualization to avoid groupthink to get into a group mind where if the OTO says it's good it's good because I mean Jonestown happened and it can't happen here the o nevertheless, we say, <laughs> nevertheless, discourse with with uh, with someone else can can serve as a honing device, uh, which can uh, facilitate uh, self understanding. Discourse and, and debate are invaluable to any intelligent mind. All I'm saying is that we have to see the difference between discourse and debate and the group think buddy buddy we're all together in this together three musketeers all of, of, one all, of all, all the or concept of all the organizations that i specifically know of the oto faces the least danger of that we are in such the number of disagreements that we've had here tonight you know should uh, help to make that clear in, in, but see in, we can also pat ourselves on the back for uh, for that <laughs> and make ourselves quite oh, fine oh, oh, oh. Maybe so, but I doubt if a Jonestown situation could occur in the OTO. Um, none of us likes Kool-Aid. None of us likes Kool-Aid. We would all complain about the different flavors, you know, and there would be so many different philosophies. All right, all right, all right. All right. All right. <laughs> the year is naturally divided into um, four cardinal points, so the two solstices and the two equinoxes. Um, times when the sun is at its highest and lowest ebb, and the days are the longest and the shortest, and the two times when the days are of absolute equal length. We know these as winter, summer, spring, and fall. Um, we also have four midpoints which occur on February 1st, May 1st, August 1st, and essentially November 1st, October 31st. Uh, we divide this into a pageant, a mythological pageant in which the sun goes through certain um, drama. And the ritual that we're seeing now is the drama of death. The sun has entered the underworld, it is the fall, it is the very late fall, the leaves have fallen, the earth is cold, um, there is no growth, um, all is within the womb of potential and the past. Traditionally this time has been celebrated as the time when the dead are um, brought out, the Halloween, the costumes, the fear, the images of, um, you know, communion with the souls of the dead. Ah, uh, this ritual is, I invoke the personification of the Lord of Death. I invoke this in a process that lasted nine months. Um, 
which may be because I'm a little slow. <laughs> Essentially, for the last two months prior to the ritual, I meditated daily on a human skull. I um, spent an enormously uncomfortable summer growing hair that was far too long for any sensible human being other than uh, someone living in the 60s. Um, I did everything I could to remind myself of the fact that I was to personify the Lord of Death. My entire period of time was a meditation on the Lord of Death and understanding of the role of death, transcendence, suffering, and what that meant to me as an individual and to humanity as a group. Um, my character was drawn from many traditions. Um, the carrying off of the jewels was straight out of the Sumerian tradition, um, the descent of Ishtar into the underworld. Um, the whipping was, was drawn from a Celtic Wiccan tradition in which the goddess is literally whipped by the Lord of Death. Um, these kinds of archetypes are common to essentially all groups of people. And I personified the archetype of Death, Pluto, Lord of the Underworld, um, who ravishes Persephone, somehow against her will, but on another level, he has her for six months of the year. Uh, separated from her mother, separated from light, separated from the fecundity of the earth, she is drawn into his kingdom, tastes of the fruit, and is stuck there. At first as an unwilling victim, and later as the queen of the underworld. Um, Lolita was the queen. Lolita was at first the unwilling victim. Lolita was Ishtar. She was all of the images of nature facing the cold, facing the non-fertility of the crops due to conditions which make planting and harvesting impossible. Um, this is a cyclical thing, and on the level of nature, it relates to planting on the level of human life it relates to suffering if there can be no planting then there is suffering as i said it was a real learning experience for me and that i you know as a person also felt as if i was descending into the realm um, of the lord of death and uh, you I can only talk about what it like, meant to me and you know, why it was difficult and why it was that I was eventually able to do it um, I'm sure any of the other women in the group could have portrayed this role um, but Jim chose me to do it and I had some problems in the very beginning. You know, I sure Bernie can remember I was having um, some serious problems. And I had to do a lot of thinking, a lot of searching within myself um, to try and figure out uh, what, what were the difficulties. And um, I feel that eventually it came together. And I understood something. I understood something about sex, death, and regeneration, and it all sort of came together at the same time. So uh, once again, I can only say that it was an internal learning experience, and playing that role just really helped me to understand the whole process of and how it relates to the cycle of rituals that we were performing um, 